are going live here. Okay, hey folks, this is Dr. Belinda Wilkerson from Steps to the Future coming to you with another Facebook Live. Now, you know, guys, that I just started using this Zoom to do Facebook Live, and it doesn't always um, agree with me, so I'm learning the technology, but I'm, I'm really thrilled that this is an opportunity um, to use this technology because, you know, we're all going through this COVID-19 together, and we all need to figure out how to do the work that we need to do in, in different ways. So bear with me as I get to, um, as I get used to using this. And I'm just checking now to see if, um, if I can find it on my phone because I always like to be able to, to follow it on my phone, just in case. And those of you out there, you make sure you share this out. Um, I see that we have somebody watching. So make sure, you know, please make sure you're um, saying hello, how you doing, say something. You know, I love to have people um, make comments out there. So I started doing this series a few weeks ago, College Conversations, So You Want to Be A, because I really think it's important that our students, in addition to thinking about what they, their post-secondary education, that they also start thinking about what is it that I want, what problem do I want to solve in this world? So we don't ask students anymore, um, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because the, the types of jobs out there change constantly. So now it's about what problem do you want to solve? So we're talking to different people in different career fields and, you know, and they'll talk about the types of problems that they want to solve and how they got to where they want to be. So this evening, I am super thrilled because I have one of my former students here with me. Um, we have Claudine Miles, formerly Claudine Varello, when I had her in school. So I was her high school counselor and you know, the best thing about being an educator is when you still stay connected to your kids. So my kids, my kids, they're always going to be my kids. I don't care how old they are, they will be my kids. So I have Claudine here and she is an educator and she's going to share with us this evening her pathway to education um, slash entrepreneur. Because one of the important things to know as you start a career is that the skills and the knowledge that you learn in one career are certainly transferable to another. Mm. So she's going to give us some information and uh, I want you to sit back and enjoy and learn. So Claudine, tell us a little bit about yourself from, so after high school, where did you go after high school? So first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, and as Ms. Wilkerson already mentioned, she was a phenomenal guidance counselor. Uh, we all lovingly refer to her as Ms. Wilkes. And so I don't really think of her as anything other. Um, but you know, when you're in your teenage years, you really feel like you know what you're talking about, but you have no idea what you're talking about. Like I swore um, at 17 and 18 that I had it figured out, that I knew what I was gonna do. Um, and I'm so grateful that I had like the privilege of this particular guidance counselor, Ms. Wilkes, because she was such a guide in helping us all kind of figure out, okay, if this is what you want to do, what are the steps that you need to take to get there? Um, and I always like let anyone know when they say, well, why did you leave Rhode Island, which is such a small community, um, which is so tight knit, which is so family centered, like, why did you leave everything that you knew? to pursue this education 20 hours away in Hampton, Virginia at um, Hampton University. And I like clearly vividly remember because my guidance counselor told me to. Miss <laughs> uh, Wilkes literally said, and I quote, like it's time to go and fly. And I am so grateful for that advice because I learned so much being on my own, um, having to do my laundry myself, you know, come up with money myself. Um, and being away from like the safety net of mom and dad was so pivotal in just pushing me to be the adult that I am today. So thank you for that. Um, awesome. <laughs> I transitioned into education. So I, I might have missed the question. Please forgive me, but oh. I got so caught up in my nostalgia. No, that's no, that's fine. That's fine. So you went to Hampton and uh, you majored in education. Actually, I majored. Um, initially in journalism. So 
I loved to write in high school and I swore I was going to be on somebody's news channel, like hosting the news, telling you the scoop. Um, but then the recession started to hit. Uh, I graduated in 2008. And at that point in about 2006, the economy was getting shaky and I was still super young, but I was starting to recognize that many graduates weren't getting jobs and that I might need to maybe pivot. Um, and I transitioned my major to English because my thought was I could get a teaching job, I could write, um, I could still pr potentially pursue journalism, but it, it would offer me a lot more flexibility in the market that was kind of shaping up to be. And so I ended up majoring in English and then Teach for America came to visit my school. And um, at that point, I was actually substitute teaching for money. That was like my little side hustle in college. And I fell in love with it. So when Teach for America came, I was like, would you ever consider being a teacher? I was like, well, initially, no. But now that I've started doing this thing and putting my toe in the pond, I really like it. And so I think that was kind of when I first decided I'm going to be an educator um, and really commit myself to serving students and families. OK, OK. So tell me, so you went from so did you do Teach for America? Yes. So. Um, it's changed a bit now, but when I first joined, they gave you the opportunity to pick three places um, that you would want to potentially live and teach. And I remember Atlanta was my first choice. I really couldn't see myself living anywhere else because of that lovely advice of like, go forth and fly. I was like, where else can I go? And so um, Atlanta just seemed like a really promising city, especially for African-Americans. I continually saw such positive imagery I saw us doing amazing things and thriving. And I was like, I wanna be in the mix of that. Um, and Atlanta was actually my placement city. So I got lucky and um, I was going to teach English initially. That was the plan, seeing how I majored in English. But then um, in the 11th hour, I sat down with the executive director of Teach for America at the time. And he said, look, I've got this amazing opportunity. You can teach at this KIPP school. They never ever take brand new Teach for America, teach for America core members um, because of maybe just a lack of experience, but they're willing to take a gamble on you. And I signed up for it, but the caveat was that I had to teach science and I was freaking out. Uh, exactly, right? I majored in English, teach science. I hadn't taken a science course since like freshman year astronomy. Um, but I was like, it's sixth grade science. I can probably do this. And so that kind of started my teaching journey. And I ended up falling in love with science. And even um, a couple of years later, when the opportunity came to take an English class, I was like, yeah, no, I like it right here. <laughs> okay. 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 And how long did you stay? Because what I was looking on your LinkedIn page and I said, oh, I said, um, she's done a little bit of stuff here. This is, the, you know, this is what's so cool with is when, you know, I think of, I think of Claudine when she was, you know, you know, in, in high school and, and to see her evolve into this woman that she is today is like, I mean, I know I'm not her mom, but it's like, it's so cool to see your kids do well, to see them um, be successful, to see that, see their light shine. So I know, you know, you were at, at KIPP Academy as, as a teacher, but then you also moved into other positions there. So tell us about those. Yeah, so early in my teaching career, um, I think because of my ability to build relationships with kids, um, I, I stood out as a teacher because things came slightly easier to me okay. um, when it came to classroom management, uh, coming by high test scores. And it really just started with, I believe, if you love kids, then they will do anything for you. Um, and I capitalized on that. I was like, oh, y'all gonna love me because I genuinely love you. And like you said, um, those will always be my kids. I don't care if they're 50. I'm like, you're my kid. Um, and they felt it. And so they worked so hard. And um, through those efforts, I was promoted to a grade level chair, which essentially meant I was managing the four to five teachers on my team. Um, and then there came this really amazing opportunity to start a gifted program. So um, traditionally in charter schools, many of them don't have gifted programs because they're often serving underserved students. Um, but what we started to uncover is we were doing a disservice to our kids. We definitely had a gifted population and they just really hadn't been exposed to the type of content that they needed to push them. And so through testing, we realized at least 10% of our students were gifted. We created a founding gifted program. 
Uh, we were able to develop quality instruction for them, provide enrichment lessons and enrichment field trips, partnerships with colleges. So it was a great opportunity to not only um, grow my expertise and my education because I did get another uh, degree related to gifted education. I also got a like the privilege to unearth this this like potential that our students had that would have been ignored if we hadn't implemented that program. And then um, through that, I became assistant principal and started working <clears throat> not just with academics because I did still have an academic load in that I was responsible for um, upper grades as well as the science department, but I also started an initiative around restorative practices. And so that was largely around transforming our school discipline model. We had traditionally been like many schools, punitive, kid gets in trouble, you get suspended, you come back, you know. Um, and what we decided was that system is inherently biased and it subjugates certain kids, usually students of color, usually underserved students to certain punishment um, that other students don't face. And so I had the privilege of taking a school, like I said, that was punitive and transforming it to a school that was restorative. Um, and so that kind of rounded out my 10 years of service at Kip Ways Academy. Okay. So for people who aren't that familiar with restorative practices, can you <clears throat> um, expand on that a little bit so they understand Absolutely. how it's different than traditional? So restorative practices um, is really a theory that proposes that instead of doing things to kids, like punishing them, or for kids, like when we hold them accountable, you actually do it with them. And so it's involving them in their own disciplinary action. Um, and one like simple story that I think makes it really easy to digest is an example that I share of one of my fifth grade students. He was walking down the hall and he had a crayon and he decided to just, you know, paint a beautiful mural on the wall. And so traditionally we would have written him up for vandalism we would have suspended him for three days and he would have come back and, and transitioned back into class. Once we transitioned to a restorative school, the approach was fundamentally different. We pulled him to the side. We had a conversation with him. We then spoke to his parent and got permission for him to be a part of a restoring project, which involved repainting the wall that he had damaged. And so he did not have to face the suspension, which is why his mother was incredibly um, willing to support. And he got to work with our building engineer, learn how to paint. And then what was funny thereafter was he had to then speak to his peers about the incident so that they could learn from it. And shortly after that, he became like the wall monitor. Like if anybody had a pencil out, he was constantly policing them, like get that away from the wall. I don't want you to write on my wall because he really internalized his mistake and we didn't have any repeat issues with that. So um, restorative practices is all about repairing harm and teaching children how to actually be accountable for their mistakes versus just punishing them. Okay. That is such a, I, I know um, when I was in Providence, well, when I left Providence in 2010, there were some, um, Providence was trying to use um, restorative practices. Uh, so that it was kind of a hit or miss because, you know, that school district has always had issues, but it was something that they were working on. So um, what, it wasn't that common in, in Rhode Island, but I knew Providence had been doing some work and trying to do it. So I had read a little bit about it, but then I moved. So <laughs> that changed. So you went from um, working in that administrative type position, um, got a fantastic opportunity to institute this restorative practices into your school culture. Um, so what so what was next in your career pathway? So at that point, I had been about 10 years, like I mentioned, at that school in particular, and I felt like um, the bug was starting to itch me of like wanting a new challenge. And the more I thought about my next steps, I just realized that the school would be okay because it had all of the right people in the right seat at the right time and they were more than willing to carry the work forward. But when I thought about the edu educational landscape um, locally in Atlanta and then nationally, I just realized there was still a gap and that this practice really helped students of color, which are the students I am most passionate about supporting and so I felt like they deserved it. And what that then bore was um, my business, which is Restore More, 
We're an educational consulting firm that solely focuses on social, emotional learning, restorative practices, self-awareness, and well-being. So we have a very niche um, wheelhouse, but we do what we do well, and we do um, training for parents, training for leaders, training for teachers, and we build student curriculum. So those are kind of our four um, buckets, and it has been incredibly different, but I loved what you said earlier about the skill set that you gain in one career absolutely can be transferable, and I am like constantly marveling at how much teaching has lent itself to the work that I do now. It's crazy. Okay. So give us an example of what a training would look like for teachers if, if you were training them in restorative practices. What, what would that look like? So we try to build really immersive trainings. Um, typically, if we're training and partnered with the school, we want to come to the school. We want to get to know your kids. We want to get to know your staff. And so we do that by engaging in um, packages. And so essentially, a school would contract with us um, for a package. That package runs usually anywhere from six to nine months. And so we'd be engaging with the school and their community on a monthly basis. And that ensures that we're a lot, like able to build quality relationships, that it's not just like a one hit service, but that we're continually following up on the learning of restorative practices. And through those six sessions, we're teaching and training educators on the importance of self-awareness, on the importance of mindset and how that impacts how we teach. Um, we delve really deeply into the history and origin of restorative practices. And then we equip teachers with the skill set to be able to bring it into their classrooms. So one key or like critical component of restorative practices are circles. And circles are when you and your students or you and your peers sit in a physical circle and pass a talking piece to discuss a topic. And so we train educators on how to do that. And all of our trainings are very much um, practice-based and they are created around evidence-based practices. So we try to make sure that whatever skill is to be transferred, that teachers have ample time to sit with that skill, they get it in bite-sized chunks, and that they have opportunities to actually practice it with their peers um, so that we can make sure that learning is transferable. So our trainings are engaging, they are fun, uh, but I would also say they're kind of emotionally tough uh, because they're going to challenge you to really unpack some of your own bias, which we know most definitely fuels um, the school-to-prison pipeline. And I would say when you had said earlier about now they're asking you, what problem are you trying to solve? That one hit me because I apply for like grants and pitch competitions all the time. And that is the number one question. Like literally the first question is what problem you're trying to solve. And so as a business, we're trying to close this school to prison pipeline because when you don't have um, equitable policies, you end up funneling more students of color through prison, through juvenile justice systems. and with our work, that's what we're looking to dismantle that entire system, so. Thank yeah. you so much. So for people who are just joining in, this is um, Claudine Miles. I knew her as Claudine Varela. Um, back in the day, I was her high school counselor at East Providence High School. And um, she, she went into education and she's sharing with us her career pathway as a educator on to becoming an administrator, on, become, on to becoming an advocate for students and an advocate for restorative practices. Um, that is a different way, a different way of disciplining students. It, it's really giving students the opportunity, opportunity to own the solution, to be part of that solution, instead of just suspending kids. For those of you that are familiar with education or ever follow the news, and when you look at the suspension rates of students in just about every community, the suspension rates of students of color is a lot higher than for students that um, that are not of color. So it's and and it's and it's a thing that we that is real, and we need to take care of that. We need to look at that. So this is what the work that um, Claudine is doing now. So she just gave us an example of what it looks like when they train teachers, because when you're doing this work. You have to train everybody. Everybody has to be part of the conversation. You can't just work with students without working with the adults, without working with the parents, because it, everybody has to own up and take a piece of this. So when you do this type of training with parents, what is what challenges you the most when you're doing this with parents? I think 
well, first, let me say this. The way we traditionally engage parents is we partner with schools. And so then schools say, hey, I want parents to be a part of this conversation and we'll provide training sessions for them. And they're kind of like in a workshop format. And so we're engaging with them in the evenings, talking about tough topics regarding social emotional health. And so I think one of the challenges in that is sometimes school leaders not recognizing the importance of bringing parents in. And, and I think you hit the nail on the head a moment ago when you said the work can't be done alone. And if you heard about our business model, we didn't leave parents out because we felt like far too times the school is trying to spearhead a lot of initiatives, but they're leaving behind the community. And those ideas don't hold because they're not investing or inviting um, stakeholders like parents in on the conversation. And so one challenge is, is just schools sometimes still writing parents off yes. and um, not securing that type of engagement or that content for their parents. So we'll constantly offer it, you know, when we're having those pitch meetings with schools and say, hey, these are some of the services we have for parents as well. And it's like, oh, our parents aren't ready for that just yet. Or, oh, our parents aren't engaged. And I'm like, well, have you ever thought about the way in which you're trying to engage them and the content that you're not, you're presenting, right? So if the content is rich and it's meaningful as a parent, I'm a parent, I'll show up. Mm -hmm. If you then make it convenient for me to be there, I will equally show up. Is there dinner? Is there childcare? Is there a prize? Like we've got to stop being so inside of the box when we think about how we engage parents and just make an assumption of like, well, they're supposed to show up. It is 2020. The world is ever changing. People are constantly tugged and pulled. And I think if we don't enter that competition and say like, no, we have to compete for our parents' attention, um, then we're going to miss out on so many important conversations that only they can add insight into. That is so true when you talked about looking at ways to engage parents. I remember, you know, my days back at the high school when we would have open houses or whatever, we would always say we would get the parents that we didn't need to see. It's the same parents, yep. But it was, but then when we step back and you look at it, it's again, just like you said, it's the way we engage parents. We have parents who, it's not that they don't care about their kids. It's not that they don't think education is important for their kids. But parents are worried about keeping a roof over their head. When they come home from work, they've got dinner to prepare. They've got other things that they need to do. And when the school says to them, you come to us and we'll will tell you what you need to know, and it's not presented as a partnership, then parents are most likely to say, okay, do I need to go and do tonight's laundry? Or do I need to go up here and have these people tell me about what I'm doing wrong and how I should be doing? And then it's also, a lot of times, parents haven't had, um, they haven't had a positive relationship with schools when they were in school. Yep. So now you're asking somebody to come back to that same territory that wasn't a pleasant place for them and to sit there and, and have a conversation and to feel talked at. Not, talk with, not having a conversation with, but here, this is what you need to know and this is how we're going to do it and, and what have you. And then sometimes parents are used to the only time a school calls them is when their kids are in trouble. Well, yep. Yeah. It's, it's funny that you said that because one of our um, best secured sessions or best selling sessions for parents is uh, social media, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so essentially, we do a 90 minute workshop with parents where we expose them to some of the images that I was privy to seeing as an assistant principal who had to conduct countless restorative conversations with students about their social media postings. And they leave feeling so empowered because not only do we expose them to like, hey, this is what your kid is really doing online, but then we give them tools and resources to be able to actually monitor their kids. And it becomes this conversation. And finally, I think, you know, when you bring in an outside source, like if I'm a school and I bring in an outside source, that creates so much freedom and flexibility because I remember being an assistant principal and being bound by certain legalities and not being able to say certain things when I really needed to say said thing. What's beautiful now is I have the freedom to say, hey, this is what you need to do just like this. And because I'm a consultant, it comes across very different because they recognize I'm not associated with the institution. And so I feel like I can talk to our parents the way we need to be best spoken to to understand the true issue. Um, so it's been really nice to engage with parents in this way and 
every parent session that we've had in the last year, we've had upwards of 100 parents. So my push to schools are, what type of content are you presenting to parents? And what are you in doing to incentivize them coming out? Because if it's not worth their while, they're not coming. Welcome to 2020. What else? That's, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. I remember, again, at least far as we were going into, I think we were doing a new, I think it was when we were starting the ILPs, the individual learning plans and all this stuff. We were having these meetings. I remember one time there was a meeting and it was a morning meeting. And I remember saying, why are we doing this now? I said, what about, well, parents can come, you know, before they go to the office. I said, well, not everybody's going to an office job. And we know our population here. And we know not everybody is going to an office job. People can't just tell their, their employer, hey, I got to take an hour. I'll be a little late. Cool. I said, especially when you're an hourly employee, you can't do that. And I said, so what are some of the things that we're going to do differently to reach out to um, parents? And I remember one of the things we talked about when, in our community, a lot of people went to church. Yes. But how do we partner with the churches? Do, can we send messages where the church secretaries will put, put it in the church bulletin so people will at least be getting some information that way? Can we partner with the church to have a meeting in the church hall? You know, because people will be comfortable coming there because yeah. that's, a place, um, that's a place where the, that's a safe space for them. So can we do that? And, you know, it was kind of like a hit or miss. We would do some, but then, you know, if, if principles change or the administration changed, then you had to start all over again. Um, so I hear what you say about that autonomy to do the work the way you know it needs to be done. Isn't that the coolest thing in the world? Oh, the best thing, especially when you have only been in structures that dictate how it needs to be done and how it can be done. It is such a breath of fresh air to be able to infuse myself into my work, um, what I know to be right from a pedagogical standpoint, um, and then just add my own flair into it and know that it's okay. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It has done wonders for like my creativity. Yes, it is. It is so much. And that's what I love about, uh, as much as I like to be a part of a school, which, which, I, which I miss, when I went to this side and, and started doing this work as a consultant, just what you said, you can put your own personality into it. I don't have someone telling me how to do lunch duty or bus duty. <laughs> you know, that is so great. My schedule revolves around my kids' schedule. I'm available at the times that they need me to be available. You know, as a school counselor, you know, you guys used to have to make an appointment before you could come down. And, it, you know, and, it, and if the teacher didn't want to let you out of class, you weren't let out of yeah. class. So, you know, otherwise it was like in the morning before homeroom or you had to come by after school, which, you know, wasn't fair to students because you were supposed to, you know, try to do that work within the school day. So I really think, I'm really appreciative of what you're doing out there because it's so needed. It is so needed. And um, hearing you talk about it and the, uh, I was going to say the word passion, trying to get kids not to use the word passion because we feel like it's overused but your your deep enthusiasm for it your your willingness to continue learning so that you can best serve your clients is 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 evident in what you're doing you know I, I try to follow your posts and I'll go and see okay what are they doing this time what kind of workshop are they doing oh they're doing this webinar this is pretty cool so it's it's just really really neat so what do you hope, what do you hope for the future of education? Such a big question. And the reason why I was pausing, right, is because we're, we're currently in this time that is forcing us to examine education in a really different light. Um, I think if you're in the work, then you're aware of the inequities when it comes to services, when it comes to preparation, when it comes to culture and how it's implemented. Um, but, but right now, the whole world is seeing yes. the dirty laundry of it all, right? And how some kids just simply based on zip code will have better access to a better quality education. And so I think this is such a unique time because I think we really do have the potential power um, and time in this moment to potentially revolutionize it if, if we advocate enough, if we speak up enough, 
if we demand it. Um, so I know, you know, the CDC recently released their guidelines of what the future of classrooms look like. And I know all my educator friends were freaking out because it was like, the desks need to be six feet apart, right? Wow. And we laughed because we were like, have you taken stock of America's classrooms as of late? Because they're horribly overcrowded. We're talking about 25 to 31 middle schoolers, elementary, whatever age, um, in one space that is often relatively small. You know, there are some classrooms in trailers throughout the country. And when you start putting social distancing guidelines like that in place, uh -huh. it gives teachers voice to say, well, that's not possible. Here's why. If we have to do that, we need more schools. That means we need more teachers. Sure. Teachers deserve more pay, wouldn't you all agree now? Um, <laughs> we realize that not every student has access to the internet, but in 2020, we also recognize that the internet is an essential part of doing work, whether you're a student or an adult. And so how do we mandate that that's just something everyone has access to, um, at least every student at a minimum, right? And not let that be a barrier to learning. So I think I have a lot of hope um, or else I don't think I could do the work that I do. I will always be incredibly hopeful and optimistic, but also determined to take the right action steps to push the work forward. But I hope that this time in particular allows space for people to advocate on behalf of kids. And I say kids first, because far too often times we're advocating for people at the top or leaders um, or even teachers. But I think one of the things that worries me is when I see schools and systems not making decisions in the best interest of kids. And if you make all of your decisions in the best interest of kids, then most other things will fall into place. Like kids will have better teachers when their teachers are paid more. So there's a rationale for justifying paying your teachers higher. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that every change will be comfortable for teachers, but I do think that I have a lot of hope for how this pandemic will positively affect education and the end hope for me is to see less students of color um, dealing with punitive practices unfairly um, and seeing more of our black and brown students continue to thrive and be successful in spaces where they were often shut out. That is so true. You know, those, those are conversations that I have with colleagues, you know, uh, frequently. Um, and, and I tell them and I said, I think of some of the experiences that I had as a black student that I still see happening today. It makes no sense. Um, when I was in, you know, eighth grade, I had, I, you know, I had a school counselor, and you know, I became that's probably why I became a school counselor, who told me that um, that I should try to be like the school secretary because I expressed an interest in becoming in going into education. He said, because your people don't go to college. I'm like, what? You know, so here's 13 years old in the top academic group, getting great grades, and he's telling me my people don't go to college. And, and the other evening I was watching um, Michelle Obama's um, documentary on Netflix mm -hmm. for like the second or third time. And she had the same experience where a counselor told her that she was not placed in the school. She wasn't material, yeah. So when when you start giving those messages to kids, especially kids that might be first gen, then um, they intend to internalize those messages. So they need folks out there who say, no, this is what you can do. And this is how you can get there. This is what it looks like. It's so important for students to have role models, to have you know more teachers that look like them. I know when I was in school, I didn't have my first um, black teacher until I was in seventh grade. I'm like, oh, wow, okay, so this is a thing. But I knew back in sixth grade I was going to be a teacher, but that was the first time I had a, uh, had a Black teacher. And, and people will say, well, what difference does that make? It does make a difference. It matters. Someone up in the classroom, in the front of the room, that looks like you. It matters. You were my first experience, I guess, dealing with anyone Black in my educational like, setting. I did have a Black principal in elementary school, but she came right at the end. Okay. Um, like in my last year, never had a black teacher all through high school. And you were my um, like closest experience to that. And then we had, um, I believe it was Dr. Spelling, am I saying it wrong? Uh, Spencer, Dr. Spencer was our principal. Yes. And she was also a phenomenal black woman. But I think 
that was such a big part of why I wanted to go to Hampton. And you're so right. Having someone that looks like you encourage you and believe in you to tell you like, yes, you can, even if you don't have all the steps clear, yes, you can. It, it makes a difference because I was a first gen. No one in my family had been to college yet. You held my hand as I filled out like every stitch of paperwork. You guided my mom and I. And, um, you know, she had always made it very clear, like college is the only option, but I never would have imagined as a young girl that I would like leave and go so far. And it was simply because you said I could and I should. Um, so I think it just underscores the importance of having people in your life that will affirm and encourage you that look like you, because otherwise it can oftentimes feel out of reach. If I don't know anyone that looks like me that's doing it, how do I know I can? Um, and you were just such a great example of like, no, you can. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I really appreciate that. You know, because sometimes when you're in the midst of the work, you really aren't sure how much of a difference you're making. You know, you just, you just hope that down the line, you see folks that have taken what you poured into them and they've, they've used it in a, in a great way. So for teachers, and you know, educators don't get paid a whole lot. So for teachers, our, our probably our biggest um, per is seeing our kids do well, seeing our kids um, grow into the people that they were meant to be, because you see that potential in them when they're younger and they don't always see it in themselves. So how do you help them um, grow and nurture that within themselves so that, so that they can grow up to be like you? <laughs> Man, stop. Having... Um great champions behind me to support me, to encourage me. I, I owe a lot to um, the woman in my life and you are definitely someone that sticks out and we still have conversations <laughs> about you. Uh, me and Marissa will almost like always joke how we spent so much time in your office. And a yeah. big part of that was because the relationship you extended towards us, it was so genuine, it was so caring. And it was always like, I expect better because you can do better. So we were always like, oh, can't do that. Miss Wilkes would be mad. Got to, <laughs> got to do well in this class because she told us to take this one. Oh, God, yes. I remember those days. I remember those days. I, I, do, I do miss that part of, of the work. But, um, but I do get to do it a different way now. I do get to do it in a different way because, like you said, when you have that, that um, autonomous freedom, there are things that you can do and say and plan in a way that uh, doesn't restrict you if you were in a school. Yeah. So the I, students I, you work with are very lucky because um, I know you're giving them such great advice. And I'm always so impressed with your continual learning journey. I'm like, man, she's such an inspiration. She's always at this conference or that conference or she's reading this and she's doing that. And I think um, that's so important in the work we do of entrepreneurship, like just continually learning how to best serve the people that you work for. So kudos to you. I'm so impressed and in awe still. Thank you. So with that being said, what, what type of professional development do you do to help you help your family? Great, great question. Um, I think it's really important to continue to stay on top of like trends and changes within my uh, niche market. And so I am certified in restorative practices, training um, and facilitation, but I redo those certifications uh, more readily than I need to. So like I just redid one um, like three months ago, right, right before all this COVID stuff, because I was like, well, it was two years ago. I want to see what updates have been made. Um, I try to stay on top of the literature in my area so that I'm just learning new practices. I also really try to study um, reports that indicate the positive changes within restorative practices to be able to have data to speak to um, its, its transformational capabilities. I think it's really important to go to conferences where you have gaps. Um, and so I try to be super intentional about going to things that I think will grow me. So, you know, when I first started this work, I had no marketing experience. I don't think I know how to run an ad. I didn't know how to post an ad. Like I just, it, it was, I knew how to post a selfie. And that's where, <laughs> that was the end of my knowledge. But I would um, definitely describe myself as like, a marketing novice now. Like I've got my basic skills down and I continually go to events that teach me new content. So like Facebook has this three-day conference that they do nationally every year called Facebook Boost. 
Um, it's free and I go every year so that I can learn how to run ads directly from the platform that we use. Um, and then I think finally, I don't underestimate the power of having a coach. Um, you had mentioned it the other day, like, oh, and this coach, da, da, da. And I was like, oh, see, everybody got a coach. And this is why you need one, because um, your inner critic will sometimes try to play imposter syndrome and tell you you're not good enough and you should, you know, you're not qualified enough. You don't have a PhD. This is this is what my inner voice tells me. <laughs> and so I think it's important to recognize, like, it's helpful to have a coach, especially if it's in an area of weakness, whether that be social media marketing um, you know, brand storytelling, uh, finances, like whatever your area of growth is, finding a coach in that. And I would say we have been incredibly blessed because we have had people gift us their highly priced coaching services that I can't afford. <laughs> so um, our business coach, Jimmy Starnes, is phenomenal. Like his retainer is $4,000 an hour. Couldn't afford him on my best day. Uh, <laughs> but he has literally gifted um, his services to us simply because we asked him to lunch one day just to like talk through ideas and through that we have grown and fostered like a beautiful client coach relationship um, and he's so insightful because he's been in business for 30 plus years and his business is completely different but one thing he knows how to do is reach your client and get a sale and no matter what your business is it's going to revolve around finding clients closing clients and I think when you pinpoint, okay, where's my area of growth, knowing that it's okay and it's going to only uh, make your business grow when you when you get that expertise. So not being afraid to seek help when you recognize you need it. Yes, yes. I thank you so much for saying that. You know, when you, when you said that phrase, imposter syndrome, it is something that, and this is where I think doing the restorative practices and, and just reaching out to students who, haven't seen those type of role models in their lives before because it, it's a real thing and it's not just people that um, don't have PhDs because those of us with advanced degrees we still sometimes find ourselves in spaces where we're like do I belong here do I have what it takes to be part of this circle um, who do I think I am being here you know so it and it doesn't and it is something you have to walk through. So I find myself very fortunate that um, I've surrounded myself with colleagues who um, definitely lift me up all the time, but we're also always learning. We're always mm -hmm. learning. I mean, I was just reading today, we were supposed to go, we were supposed to have our annual, one of our conferences um, this past month, but of course it, you know, it, it got um, postponed and moved to July. And we actually just got a notice today that it's going to be um, virtual, which is great, you know, um, because at least I know um, the staff at, at IECA is going to create this wonderful opportunity for us. So we're still going to be doing, we're still going to be learning. So that's, that's great. And that, that feeds me because you're so right. You know, we, we do need to continue learning what else is happening out there. What's new, because things are changing. This is 2020 and things change so much faster than they did back in the day when I was at East Providence High School. So that, that, is, that is really crucial. So what would you say to a young person who wanted to get into education? I wrote a blog on this topic first. It was like the five things you need to know before you get into education. And I will spare you all five. I think the biggest takeaway though is no matter what you want to do, I need people to experience it before they leave. Um, and, and I say that because I've met so many people in careers that are thriving, that are struggling, but at the end of the day, they don't feel like they fit in that space. They don't feel like they belong in that space, but they have worked so hard to get there. They have the degree, they have the certification, they have their family support, and then they want to pivot. And it's so scary. Uh, because at that point, you know, you've aged a bit, you've got doubt settling in, you've got your family wondering why you're leaving that cushy job that your degree goes with. <laughs> um, and so rather than get to that place and have to be a little reactive, I think I would just caution young people to like find a way to experience what that work looks like on the day to day, uh, because there's only so much internet research that you can observe. Uh, there's only so much secondhand telling that you can really receive. But I think when you go into a space and do the work, 
you really get to see the nitty gritty. And if you go armed with the right questions, I think you can really gain so much insight into, is this really something I want to do? Is this work going to fuel me um, and, and keep me zesty 20, 30, 40 years from now? Um, because you have to think of your education as like an investment. I'm investing into what the rest of my life will look like. And you can't make those decisions lightly. What's challenging is you're so young at the time and you <laughs> swear you've got it figured out. Um, so even for me, I think it's weird now when I look back on it, I'm like, man, your purpose really was to teach because I remember babysitting cousins when I was young and I would come up with like a whole evening agenda and activities and it would always be like some learning in there. And they'd be like, remember when you did that? And I'm like, yeah, I did do that. Sure. Um, and then even in high school, you had encouraged me to take a course where I was supporting students with special needs. And we were essentially in there like co-facilitating learning and life skills. And then in college, I gravitated towards substitute teaching. Like there were a million of, you know, simple mm -hmm. jobs I could have picked out, but that was the one that like really spoke to me. And I think because I knew what I was getting into, I felt more confident about it. Did I know everything that teaching entailed? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> and those first two years prove it. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. Those, that's <laughs> so many mistakes in those early years, but because I was able to step foot into that world, I had a really clear understanding of like, okay, teachers have a ton of lesson planning, they work with kids, but then there's also bus duty, there's parent phone calls, there's emails. Like I was clear on what I was undertaking. And so there wasn't this like, um, you know, period where I fell out of love with my work because I was so overwhelmed. It was a lot and it was overwhelming at times, but I've never fallen out of love um, with education. So I would just caution young people to find someone you can shadow. If you don't know someone, um, ask a parent. If they know someone, ask a guidance counselor, like find someone that knows someone that does what you're interested in and see if you can shadow them for a day because you will learn so much more in that day than you could um, in hours of research. That is excellent, excellent advice. I mean, I, I'm working with a colleague now. We're working on a, a, a career awareness, career development syllabus for high school students and that was one of the things we were talking about getting the opportunity it doesn't you know kids think about internships and you know being a paid internship but go out and do an informational interview find out why that person got in that work what is their day like and anytime you like you said that you can shadow somebody because it's just important to know what you don't want to know what you want so and, true and I'm with you. I know so many people that are in careers that pay the bills, but they don't satisfy their soul. Mm -hmm. And when you think about that, we have to be in work the majority of our day. Why would you not set yourself up so that you're in, in a position where you're miserable most of the day? It just yeah. doesn't make sense. And I, and I agree with you. I, I'm fortunate in that I found a career in education that no matter what role I'm playing, it feeds me, it fills my bucket. Mm -hmm. and what I want to do, I've never, like you said, you get tired of, you know, you might get overwhelmed, but you never say, oh God, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, you always find some, some way to make it work. So this has been really great. I love connecting with kids. Hey, so you all the guys out there that I had as, as a, um, as, as council leads, I'm probably going to be hitting you up to come out and, and, and do an interview. So, so all of you don't be hiding now when you see my messages coming out to you. So you're next tag. You're next. But I thank you so much because I think it's so important for students to be able to hear from someone who's actually in a career that they're thinking about um, and, and what it entails. And I think sometimes when people say, well, I'm going to go into education, they don't see past classroom teacher or administrator. So yeah. you've taken that and you've pivoted, but you're using those same skills. You've transferred them over to another um, facet of education, but one where you're also using entrepreneurial skills. And it, guys, anybody out there, you, I don't care what you're doing, try to take some classes in entrepreneurship. If, if you don't wanna take courses, um, you don't want to go to college for it or what have you. There's so much free stuff out there um, because I think in, as the years keep going on, more and more people are going to be doing work that has an entrepreneurial bent. 
that's just the way the world is. Um, and you see what happens um, with COVID-19, with people getting laid off, you know, because we work with someone else. So we need to figure out, you know, start it as a side hustle. Keep your day job. Start it as a side hustle. And then, and then keep on uh, moving. Um, one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Russ Sabella, who is a um, director of counseling program at Florida Gulf Coast University, actually has a book uh, about side hustles for school counselors. Oh, I it, love that. Yeah, I think it came out last year. Um, and, it, and that's what it's about, different side hustles that, that people can do. Because you always need to be thinking, you know, again, that question, what problem do you want to solve? So that's what I'm going to leave folks with tonight. So as you're thinking about um, career pathways, as you're having conversations with your students, as you, you know, those conversations around the dinner table, because now we can have them around the dinner table um, mm -hmm. or in the car or what have you, you know, that's the question you want to ask. What problem is it that you want to solve? And go from there. I thank my guests this evening because it was... It was a delight. It was an absolute delight. And, I'm, and I'm, when I get ready to stop this, I'm going to ask you to stay on for a few minutes. But folks, make sure if you're not watching this um, live, you know, you're watching the replay, make sure you put in the comments replay so that I know that you watched it. And please share this out because I think it's so important that our young folks hear from other folks about what the possibilities are for them. Um, we're talking about our, you know, our possible selves. And we want our kids to know that it's, it's, it's open to them. They just have to go out and do the work. So again, Claudine, thank you so much. Thank for you for having me. And audience, I will see you next Monday with another College Conversations, and we'll see. So you want to be a, hmm, got to work on that, see what the next one's going to be. Take care, everyone. And I'm going to stop this, and I will see you next Monday.